in the first lecture of any corporate finance class, your professor will say something like, the goal of a company is to maximize shareholder value. And in fact, it's not just your professor. If you read the textbook, your textbooks will say things like, and this is pictures I took out of my own textbooks, the primary objective of the corporation, value maximization. Or another textbook, goals of the corporation, shareholders want managers to maximize market value and it's not just your professors and it's not just your textbooks. It's also our AI chat or overlords. Uh, I asked one, what's the main goal of corporate finance? It answered the primary goal of corporate finance is to maximize shareholder value. So you hear this phrase over and over and over again when you're beginning corporate finance. And if you're like me, it kind of rubs you the wrong way. <laughs> At least it rubs me the wrong way. I think, oh, it's, you know, feels like a evil, greedy person wearing a monocle, holding a satchel full of money made up this phrase. And it, it bugged me. But the more I understand business, uh, the more I understand that this is, uh, I would say, neither good nor bad. It is just a reality of how businesses operate. And it's more to do with the mechanical way a business works. And so in this video, I just hope to explain why it is the way it is. So this will be a video all about the why we always say the goal of a company is to maximize shareholder value. Is it good or bad? I'm not going to make that value judgment here, but it is, and it's important to understand why. And it's not greedy capitalists with monocles underneath it all. It's just it's a logical outcome of how businesses operate. So how do the businesses operate? Well, here you are a, a potential shareholder in a business and you decide, yes, I'd like to buy some shares in that big fancy tech company I've been hearing so much about, Apple or Amazon or Meta or Netflix or something like this. And you decide, yes, I will buy a share in that company. And when you buy the share of the company, there you are in the corner, you of course join a diverse group of shareholders, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, other shareholders are also owners of the company. And what you quickly realize, and if you've ever owned anything where you owned a part of something. So my brother, sister, and I, we all share in a vacation property. We all take turns and take a week or two at the vacation property each summer. Well, what you learn very quickly is like our vacation property, there are three owners we disagree on everything. We can't get along. It's very difficult to own something together with other people. And that's with people I love. When I own Apple, I don't love all the other shareholders. I don't even like them. So how are we supposed to work together? And the answer is, well, we don't agree on much of anything. We don't agree how Apple should be run yet. We're the owners of the company. When you're the shareholder, you are the owner of a company. So because this group simply can't be expected to agree on anything, what happens is the group, and we'll go through the mechanics of this in a future chapter, the group has to elect a small, small group to represent their interests. So what they do is they'll run an election to choose a board of directors. And these this board of directors should be experienced in business, similar to the business you're investing in. They should be smart, ethical people that will protect your interests as shareholders. Now, the question the board has to ask is, well, what do our shareholders want, right? Like, okay, we've been chosen to represent their interests. What do the shareholders want? And the answer could be, you know, you imagine Apple, oh, should we make bigger iPhones or smaller iPhones? Well, I want smaller iPhones. This is a mini iPhone. They don't even make them anymore. It really chokes me. Uh, maybe more people want larger iPhones. Who knows what people want, right? And this shareholder group's not going to agree, oh, we should make smaller or larger iPhones. Uh, in fact, this shareholder group's not going to agree on much of anything. So that leaves the board in a weird spot. They have to represent the interests of a group of people that agrees on nothing, right? They can't get agreement on strategic direction or small details that the company might be interested in. Well, what can this group agree on? So the, the board would be wise to ask themselves, like, what would this group of shareholders agree on? And there's one thing every single one of these shareholders ought to want, and I would argue does want. 100% of them would like to see the stock price go up. Why do they want to see the stock price go up? 
Well, they bought stock, right? All you have to do, just do it once in your life, buy a share of something, buy a share of Apple or Amazon or Facebook or whatever company you want to buy. Buy one stock and you'll see it in yourself. You'll say, I'd like to see this stock price go up. So every single one of these people, they don't agree on anything. They don't agree, should we make small phones, big phones? They don't agree, should we uh, build a factory here, there, or anywhere? They don't agree on any of that, the design or anything like that. They all agree the stock price should go up. And that's what's at the root of the introductory question. So the shareholders, the group that owns the company, these are, you know, again, you own 51% of the shares. It's your company to run. This group of diverse people with totally different interests are in 100% or close to it, 100% alignment in one thing. They bought the share hoping the price would go up. So they elect a board of directors and the board of directors goes, well, the shareholder group doesn't agree on anything, but they all agree that the stock price, they'd like to see it go up. The board then, this is the mechanics of how a company works. The board has the power to hire and fire the CEO, the chief executive officer, the CEO's job is to run the company. The CEO hires and fires, you know, the marketing manager and the HR manager and the des product designers, all that stuff. The CEO is the top person in the company that's able to do that. Uh, but the board can hire and fire the CEO and the CEO oversees the company. So again, just to sort of reiterate this relationship, hopefully that all fits on a screen and is reasonably visible to you. You, this little guy in the corner, are a shareholder of the company because there's thousands, potentially sh thousands of shareholders with diverse interests. Even if there's two or three shareholders, they can't agree on much. Uh, the shareholder group will elect a board of directors. The board of directors role is to advise and help the CEO in representing the shareholders' interests. So the shareholders select the board, the board represents shareholders' interests. How do they do that? They hire a CEO that they think will help shareholders do the one thing they can agree on, which is maximize the value of the shares. Now, at a functional level though, the board is really important. The board helps the CEO run the company. And I thought I'd show you Apple's current board of directors. So the CEO of the company is Tim Cooks. Tim Cooks sits on the board of directors, but the name I actually wanted to hone in on is this person on the board of directors, Al Gore. If you don't know who Al Gore is, he was pre uh, vice president of the United States. He was very nearly president of the United States, missed by uh, maybe hundreds or a few thousand votes in Florida way back when. Uh, anyway, a very politically connected figure. Well, why do you think Al Gore is on the board of directors advising Apple because Al Gore surely doesn't know more about chips or phone production than you or I do. Uh, but the reason Al Gore is there is because Apple is such a huge and powerful company. They're important to the United States government. So wouldn't it be useful to understand or to have somebody on your team who understands lawmakers and regulators, how they're going to behave? That's why Al Gore can give advice to Tim Cook, not on what chips to put on the phone, but on uh, how to operate within government, right? How, how to maneuver the US government. Uh, they also have the CEO of Boeing. Well, Boeing, you know, it's one of the few companies that would be similar to Apple in terms of supply chain and ordering parts and needing parts to be very specific specs. So again, that's why a Boeing CEO can give Tim Cook advice. Uh, this Susan Wagner of BlackRock. BlackRock's one of the biggest investing companies in the world. So she can advise Tim Cook on what investors are looking for, right? And so all these people can give their expertise and lend their advice to help the company run better and ultimately, if I can zoom properly, oh, there we are. Sorry, I was having a hard time finding it. Ultimately, the idea is this board represents the shareholder group and advises the CEO as to how the CEO should run their company better. That's it. So at the end of this, I hope you're seeing, and again, I'm not trying to make a judgment call as to whether this is good or bad. It just is. This is the reality of running a company. The shareholders are the owners. They elect a board to represent their interest. And the only thing the shareholders agree on is that they'd like to see the stock price go up. Now, it can be done in 
any way, right? It doesn't have to be, oh, we need to maximize profits. We need to cut costs. We need to be mean to our employees or something like this. Uh, it just means these folks would like to see their stock price go up and they hire people to represent them. That's why the goal of a company is to maximize shareholder value.